Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. I'm Mary Kay Zaravlov, and our guest today is author Emma Donahue. Emma Donahue is the best-selling author of a dozen works of fiction, as well as literary history and plays. Born in Dublin in 1969, she earned a PhD from Cambridge in 1997. But by the time she had finished her dissertation, she had already published two novels, Stir Fry and Hood, and a book of reimagined fairy tales called Kissing the Witch. In 1998, Donahue left England for Canada, where she lives with her partner and their two children. A master of many genres, she often writes in her words, fiction that walks arm in arm with fact. In fact, four of her next six books were historically inspired fiction, largely set back in Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries. Slammerkin, Life Mask and The Sealed Letter are novels inspired by stories of murder, a love triangle, and a celebrity divorce case. And the short stories in The Woman Who Gave Birth to Rabbits are based on events from the 14th to the 19th centuries. Her passion and talent for research are equal to her imagination and curiosity. In 2010, she published Inseparable, Desire Between Women in Literature, a scholarly and witty guide to girl-on-girl -girl passion in literature from the medieval era to present day. That same year, her novel, Room, became an international sensation, and it will soon be a movie based on her screenplay. Inspired by an actual long-term abduction case, Room tells the story of a woman and her young son held captive for years in a small shed. By choosing the five-year-old boy as the narrator, a child whose whole world is room and who's never separated from his beloved Ma, Donahue transformed the frightening premise into a wondrous page turner and a testament to parental love. Since that blockbuster, she's written two more books looking back toward the 19th century, the story collection Astray, inspired by actual and often unsettling stories of people crossing boundaries, and another best-selling novel, Frog Music which revisits an unsolved murder in 1870s San Francisco. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Mine too, Mary Kay. Thank you for being here. We are here for an Irish festival, so I thought we would start there. You grew up in Dublin, one of eight children, and moved to England and now Canada. And I've heard you mention that, um, that boundary of not wanting people necessarily to remark on your accent, but not wanting to lose it either. So I thought you could tell us I how you see yourself. I think the first 20 years shapes you forever. You know, even if I stay in Canada forever, I'll always be Irish because culturally speaking, you know, that, that early soaking, the marinating in, in one particular culture, it leaves a permanent mark. So I would say even though I'm very happy in Canada these days and, you know, I learned a lot from my eight years in England as well, but I think I'm definitely Irish because that's how I was raised. So always Irish and in the, in the pantheon of Irish writers, who especially struck your fancy? Who do you especially love or hear? I think if just one of us had to be salvaged from the bonfire, I think Roddy Doyle is superb. And, mm. and not everybody would agree, you know, to some people he seems a bit populist, but I think he's superb because he's got all that really colloquial vernacular humor and the, con the contemporary, you know, his finger on the pulse. Um, and yet he also tackles really substantial historical nation building issues as well in his historical trilogy. Um, so I think he's absolutely dazzling, so he'd be my top choice. Well, and character and voice, which are, I mean, you have many, many strengths. But let's talk about voice. I was thinking in a family of eight kids, and you're the youngest. That... Yeah, so I had to sort of fight for room in the family conversation, you know, and I know I used to get it wrong as a child. Sometimes I'd, I'd gather my opinion on a subject, and by the time I managed to insert it, in fact, the topic had moved on, and so they'd look at me like, that was a non secretary. <laughs> But it certainly, it certainly made us competitive and loquacious. So the fact that all my characters pretty much talk too much, um, I think, can be traced back to it's that your noisy turn. house. <laughs> it's true, it's true. But also the listening. You were listening I for I hope years. we were listening to each other. And, of course, there was quite a lot of emphasis on 
getting through your dinner as fast as possible so you'd have the first uh, you'd be the first to attack the mince pie so um i'm not sure we were always deeply listening to each other but um it was a big and noisy house certainly mm -hmm. and um, it was a very bookish house as well because my dad's a literary critic so not only were the walls lined with books but um quite a few of them had his name on them so it seemed to me that writing books was a perfectly normal way to spend your days so you knew that people were writers that was no surprise to you and that people made their living that way what about music? Was there a lot of music in the household? There was. Now, not, we, we, we weren't very traditionally Celtic in our culture. You know, my, my parents did a lot of reading Jane Austen and listening to Chopin. They both loved classical music. My dad had been a very good leader singer. So I wasn't really raised in what most Americans would think of as Irish culture. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't oral tradition and storytelling by the fire. It was quite a, you know, a upper middle class bookish sort of household. So not so many ditties either. No, and it's funny, I only came to love all those Irish ballads when I left home. I mean, my latest novel, Frog Music, is absolutely full of folk songs. Um, and I only really got interested in that as an emigrant. I think emigrants just have this hankering for the, the homeland that's always out of reach. And um, Well, and those songs have such a feel for the homeland. Huge, a huge power, yeah. And I absolutely, I got very, very interested in, in, in folk music while writing frog music because I, because I'd chosen a title with the word music in there, uh, frog music is a phrase I've made up for the, the grunting of lots of horny male frogs. <laughs> but I thought, oh, I have to throw in a few songs to match the title. And suddenly I had about 37 songs littering the book. And I got more and more interested in how songs like Emigrants, you know, they, they change as they cross the ocean and they, they, they vary in their lyrics and their tunes and they keep morphing with every generation. Well, let's, I was going to start with Room, but let's start with Frog Music because that um, research but also ear is so evident and how you found, um, I'd love for you to talk about the different kinds of songs uh, for those who haven't yet enjoyed this beautiful novel, the different levels of song that are in this book and how you found them. Well, Frog Music is about, a, it's about an unsolved murder that they really never successfully solved. A young woman of 26 got gunned down through the window of a railway saloon, and she was the perfect murder victim, really. She lived as if she knew she wasn't going to see 30. Um, she was reckless. She picked fights in bars. She cross-dressed. She was regularly arrested. She was just about the only person that San Francisco was using its anti-cross-dressing laws against in the 1870s. And um, they, they, you know, they rounded her up once a month and fined her or... or Fine, and her only jail. her. Yes. She was just born trouble and her sense of humor just comes across the centuries. You know, in newspaper articles, they would quote her saying something like, well, Your Honor, you know, I don't have any other clothes. Would you rather I walk naked? So just this, this sense of irrepressible, seize the day, you know, reckless hedonism it made just made Jenny Bonnet the, the ideal murder victim for literary purposes. Um, but I ended up telling the whole story through the point of view of the survivor, the other woman who was in the room when those bullets flew, um, Blanche Bonon, who was a, a, a burlesque dancer, a French erotic dancer, basically. And so everybody in the book had a performance background because I knew Blanche and her man and his friend had all been circus performers. And I knew that Jenny had been a child actor. So I thought there'd be a a relaxed and casual level of singing. And one thing I discovered in my researches was that people sang in public with no embarrassment back then. They, they didn't feel like their singing was no good compared with the radio because there was no radio. So mm -hmm. people sang in public all the time. So I really enjoyed sort of stitching the whole novel together with songs, whether, you know, gospel songs or body songs or children's or lullabies. Or lullabies. I mean, yeah. it's lovely. It's such another element of characterization, and it, it just works beautifully. Would you read to us from sure, Frog sure. Music? Did we I select a spot to, yes, that has song? I'm going to read a little scene where one thing I hadn't expected about Blanche is that she, she turned out to have this baby in the background. She, she and her man had had a baby and then had it farmed out, you know, full-time daycare, and this was quite a common arrangement in, in 19th century cities. But of course, a lot of these baby farms were um, less than ideal places to leave your child. So this is a little scene where Blanche is going to collect her, her wages from the madam of the brothel that she um, works at as a very, you know, high-paid uh, courtesan, shall we say. Um, and she's collecting her wages and she's asking... Um, the um, mad madam about the welfare of, of, of the baby. Um, Whom she hasn't, if I can in interrupt you, she hasn't given much thought to until Jenny 
saw the photo in her room and said, who's that? And just saying that question to her. That's right. The, the brand new friendship between Blanche and Jenny is sort of provoking Blanche to, to question some of her choices. So she's, um, she's asking Madame about uh, the baby Petit in the context of a smallpox epidemic that's just hit San Francisco. Perhaps I should pay him a visit there, Blanche says tentatively. The widow purses her pale lips. I know it's not our usual procedure, says Blanche, but these aren't ordinary times. Madame Joanna shakes her head. Frau Hoffmann finds that parents disrupt the routines. Blanche bristles at that. Routines? That makes the place sound more like a school or a hospital than a home for babies. How many infants could there be lodging with one family of farmers? Blanche supposes she should have looked into these details before, but at the end of each visit, she's always been rather grateful to wave goodbye as the nurse totes her small burden away in his basket. Now, one of these days, of course, Petit will be grown enough that everything will be different. He'll sit up or stand, finally stretch out his arms to Maman, ready to be carried back to Sacramento Street to see his papa, and perhaps even to stay with Blanche and Arthur when the time is right. She tells Madame now, I'm just a touch anxious because of the heat and the epidemic. Naturally, says Madame. But your little one's very well. How do you know? Frau Hoffmann would have informed me if the case were otherwise. This is where Blanche should really accept her hundred in worn notes, pull on her lace gloves, pick up her parasol, and say her merci. But there's something veiled in the... Excuse me. There's something veiled in the Madame's tone that bothers her. Where do they live exactly? asks Blanche. A hiss of breath from the madam. If you are irrational enough to insist on putting your child at greater risk in order to set your mind at rest, I will have him brought here this afternoon. I just find it a little odd that you don't seem to want me to see this farm, says Blanche. An elegant shrug of the silk-covered shoulders. You are a free woman, but I find it equally odd adds Madame with an implacable smile. I find it equally odd that you're suddenly so curious after almost a year. Blanche is on her feet now, her knuckles on the carved bureau. What's the damn address? Madame Johanna seems to be weighing something. Folsom, she says at last. Blanche has never heard of a village by that name. She stares. Folsom Street in San Francisco, here. That's right downtown in the mission. She's probably gone past the door a hundred times. I wonder, says Madame, I wonder how you picked up the impression it was outside the city. You've always called it a farm. Whereabouts on Folsom Street, demands Blanche. Sit down, Madame sighs. You have proved your point. Underneath that famously snowy decolletage beats a mother's heart. I will send for your baby this minute if you like. Blanche sees red. What number on Folsom Street? 1422, says Madame. So Blanche strides towards the door and then turns back to snatch up her parasol and gloves. I always thought we understood each other, murmurs Madame. Mm. Thank you. Um, Madame Joanna is um, based on a real Madame of the time, and I really enjoyed the chance to write a Madame character because, you know, they're almost always portrayed in novels as really kind of, you know, fleshy, opium-inhaling, you know, sensual former prostitutes. And I wanted to make this one much more like the nuns who taught me at school, you know, very much a business <laughs> it's, I was going to say, it, it is a business. It may happen to be the flesh trade, but she's a cold, business-like woman, you know, and um, a virgin, in fact. So I, I really wanted to bring out the kind of, you know, cold economic side of the whole thing. Well, and also, I mean, that is such a great scene because prior to that moment, Blanche has this fantasy of her child frolicking. I mean, he's under one, but that he's being taken care of in the green, beautiful farm, sort of like the dog going to the country. Exactly. She's just not asking. She's got this very floppy, small, not thriving baby who she sees once a month, and she's just not really asking herself the question. And he's in a farm with hundreds of others. Yeah, yeah. He's in a hideous urban farm. And it's yeah. Jenny's just appearance that changes all well, that. Well, in a way, I, I knew it was going to be a novel about friendship in a way, because all I knew about these people was that they got to know each other, they all fought, and a few weeks later, Jenny was dead. You know, the novel starts with her death. So I knew that it was always going to be about a, a, quick, a quick slide from friendship to murder. And so I wanted friendship 
to be shown as as interestingly dynamic in its effects, not just some sort of blandly support of bond. You like pizza? Women. I like exactly, pizza. Exactly, but no, more like you know, dynamic. these two women got to know each other and everything fell apart. Mm -hmm. you know? Was it was that a real headline in the paper? Women's mania for wearing male attire ends in death. Was that? That is unchanged, yes. I, a lot of history, you don't have to make it up. You couldn't do any better. You know? mm -hmm. Yes, the New York Times sort of subtly implied that Jenny Bonnet's cross-dressing had pretty much earned her those eight bullets. Mm. Yeah. No, well, it's funny, the status of cross-dressing, Jenny Bonnet was quite a popular figure in San Francisco. You know, she was clearly seen as rather fun. Some of the newspapers spoke fondly of her. But when she got murdered, nobody was too surprised, mm. you know. I, I love that you built this from that headline. And... And so Room is also based on... Yes, in a very different way. Completely. Uh, Room is far less factual than my historical novels are, but I got into more trouble for the factual element just because it's contemporary. So, you know, I was quite honest about the fact that it happened to be the Fritzl case in Austria where a man kept his daughter locked up for more than 20 years and had many children by her. Um, I was very honest about the fact that it happened to be that case that suggested room to me. And so, you know, the, the book has often been reviewed as the Fritzl novel, you know, which appalled me. So I hadn't realized that when you draw on any contemporary headlines, people get so excited by the true crime element that you can't shake that off. Yeah, what is true? You know, I write far more factual fiction when I'm writing about history. Well, in fact, I wasn't even going to talk about the Fritzl case because I was going to make that distinction that, that really frog music was built on that case. It seemed like you took that headline, you took that era, you took the, the people that might have been involved. Um, but Room, the, as claustrophobic as it is, the level of imagination, it's only the premise that um, Oh yeah, that really all I took from it. the Fritzl case was, you know, a child growing up in a locked room and not knowing that that was not the whole world. That, 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 was, the, that was the thing that seized my imagination. That, you know, in order to protect your child from the knowledge of what they were missing, that you might not tell your child that they were a prisoner at all. And so that immediately became a kind of a fable to me. And I remember thinking I wanted to be a bit like a fairy tale and, you know, a bit like a nightmare and a bit like science fiction because it's almost as if, you know, man and Jack are living on this little little planet like in, in um, The Little Prince, say. You know, it's their own miniature world. And, and I thought, a testament to her. She's created that world for him so that he won't be destroyed. And created it for herself too because, yes. you know, it gives great meaning to her days to have all sorts of little jolly rituals with him. So so they've saved each other, but the difference is that she knows the darkness. Yes. But of course, every adult does know the darkness. I mean, whenever, whenever my kids ask me something about the world, you know, I, I find I'm sort of doling out little bits of darkness. I might tell them about the Nazis, but then I'll say, oh, and then everything was fine at the end. You know, well, even the say, first time you find the dead bird on the sidewalk, is it dead? <gasps> Exactly. Or is it sleeping? Yeah, we constantly come up with, you know, versions of the truth. We're constantly uh, tinkering with the stories we tell our children, and we rely on, on magical thinking to make those stories bearable for them. So we filter the world. And so, in a way, Ma is just an extreme version of what we all do as parents. We're always dithering over whether to give our children a bit more freedom or a bit more safety. Um, we're always feeling fond of the kind of magic circle of the parent-child bond, and yet restless and claustrophobic. I know, but the imagination that you ex that you exercised in that book makes the reader a little bit uh, jealous, isn't the right word, but but um, ad admiring her that oh, if only I could be a mother such as that. You know, she oh, really no, opens I'm not the that world. Mother. <laughs> I'm the you know you play on your iPad. I'm emailing. You know, you talked about creating Jenny's voice and creating Jenny from from the um, headline. Can you talk about creating Jack's voice in Room? Sure. Um, I, I, I was very lucky. My son Finn was five years old at the time. So How I convenient. followed him around and I wrote down uh, not everything he said but all his grammatical mistakes. I was very interested in the way children flavor language. Um, and I realized that in fact five-year-olds make so many mistakes that if you were to transcribe them. It would be far too irritating to the adult reader. And they're too repetitious as well. So I thought, okay, Jack in the book has had an unusually intense kind of education. His mother has been giving him the benefit of her full attention all the time, unlike real children in the real world. So I thought he could be a little bit advanced, so I will let him tell stories fairly coherently, but I need some kid grammar to give it that flavor. Um, so his voice is actually a kind of a, a careful mixture of adult and child qualities. You um, made up a kid diction. Yeah, yeah, and I decided that he would have a few traits that five-year-olds pretty much all have, that he would try and use logical grammar rather than 
English grammar the way it is. So children often try and give um, verbs a logical past tense. They'll say, I, I, f I founded the banana instead mm -hmm. of I found the banana. Um, they often get a bit confused about, about um, time and tenses and so on. Um, and what else? Yeah, I decided he would have a few traits specific to his environment. I thought he would probably, in a way, see a kind of spirit or character in everything because children long to make friends. So if he doesn't have any friends, I thought he'll, he'll say, hello, table. You know, he'll, every child who plays with a knife and a fork is doing the same thing. And I mm -hmm. thought Jack would probably turn each object in the room into a, you know, capital letter, proper noun, and he would give it a gender as well. You know, it struck me one day that he would probably see, you know, the curvy sofa as, as female and the straight table as male and so on. So um, he's got a few oddities. But oh, that's wonderful. His, I don't find his, his voice that unusual, but it just, seemed, it just seemed right for him. It seems both invented and age appropriate. Could you read to us sure. from his voice? Here's a little scene in the first chapter when Jack is still completely innocent. He still thinks that this is the whole world. After nap, Ma says she's figured out that we don't need to ask for a measuring tape for Sunday treat. We can make a ruler ourselves. So we recycle the cereal box from ancient Egyptian pyramid. Ma shows me to cut a strip that's as big as her foot. That's why it's called a foot. And then she pull, puts 12 little lines inside. I measure her nose that's two inches long. My nose is one inch and a quarter. I write it down. Ma makes ruler flip slow-mo somersaults up door wall where my tolls are. She says, I'm three feet, three inches. Hey, I say, let's measure room. What, all of it, asks Ma. Do we have something else to do? She looks at me strange and she says, I guess not. I write down all the numbers like the tall of door wall to the line where roof starts equals six feet, seven inches. Guess what, I tell Ma. Every cork tile is nearly a bit bigger than ruler. Duh, she says slapping her head. I guess they're a foot square. I must have made the ruler a little too short. Let's just count the tiles then, Jack. That's easier. So I start counting the tall of bed wall, but Ma says all the walls are the same. And another rule is the wide of the walls is the same as the wide of floor. So I count 11 feet going both ways. That means floor is a square. Table is a circle, so I'm confused. But Ma measures her across the middle, where she's the very widest. That's three feet, nine inches. My chair is three foot two inches tall, and Ma's is the exact same. That's one inch less than me. Then Ma's a bit sick of measuring, so we stop. I color behind the numbers, all different, with our five crayons that are blue, orange, green, red, brown. When I'm done, the page looks like rug, but crazier. Ma says, why don't I use it as my placemat for dinner? I choose spaghetti tonight. There's a fresh broccoli as well that I don't choose. It's just good for us. I chop the broccoli into pieces with zigzag knife. Sometimes I swallow some when Ma's not looking and she says, oh no, where's that big bit gone? But she isn't really mad because raw things make us extra alive. Ma does the hotting up on the two rings of stove that go red. I'm not allowed to touch the knobs because it's Ma's job to make sure there's never a fire like in TV. If the rings ever go against something like a dish towel or our clothes even, flames would run all over with orange tongues and burn room to ashes with us coughing and choking and screaming with the worst pain ever. I don't like the smell of broccoli cooking, but it's not as bad as green beans. Vegetables are all real, but ice cream is just TV. I wish ice cream was real too. Ma, is plant a raw thing? Well, yeah, Jack, but not the kind to eat. Why, she doesn't have flowers anymore? Ma shrugs and stirs the spaghetti. She says, plant got tired. She should go to sleep. Well, she's still tired when she wakes up, says Ma. Maybe the soil in her pot doesn't have enough food left in it. She could have my broccoli. Ma laughs and she says, not that kind of food, plant food. We could ask for plant food for Sunday treat. I've got a long list of things to ask for already, Jack. Where, I say. Just in my head, she says. She pulls out one worm of spaghetti and she bites it. I think they like fish. Who do? Plants, Jack, they like rotten fish or is it fish bones? Yuck, I say. Maybe next time we have fish fingers, we can bury a bit under plant, she says. Not one of my fish fingers. OK, Jack, a bit of mine. The why I like spaghetti best is the song of the meatball. I sing it when Ma fills our plates. After dinner, something amazing. We make me a birthday cake. 
I bet it's going to be delicioso with candles the same number as me and on fire like I've never seen for real. Leave Thank there. you so much. And so soon a motion picture. I can't wait for that. I know. I have to say um, it's, it's been thrilling being involved as the screenwriter because everyone assumes that if the novelist is the screenwriter that she'll be sort of fighting to keep it exactly like in the book. But it's not like that. It's more that you want... You want to translate the spirit of the story. Yeah. So I would say that every scene in the film comes from somewhere in the book, but they may end up, you know, there may be different details or they may end up saying different words, but, but it's a translation of the spirit of the whole thing into cinema. Oh, I can't wait. And what novel or short story collection is catching your eye these days? Are you working on one or the other? Um, oh, I'm always working on a few things, but um, mostly I'm uh, working on a children's book because I think it's really important, especially after you happen to have had one hit, it's really important to set yourself new challenges because you shouldn't ever get smug as a writer or start repeating yourself. Um, I've never wanted to be a sort of brand, you know, and you couldn't really make a brand of novels about children no, growing up can't. in sheds. And also writing from a child's voice for an adult audience. Now you've got a whole different challenge. Again, again, I wouldn't want to make a brand of that. So, um, yeah, with Frog Music, I decided to try and do a murder mystery for the first time. And now I'm trying to write for, for um, children, sort of 8 to 12, the middle school market. And that's, yes, a whole other challenge. And I'm far more scared of them as an audience, especially a live audience. You know, the idea of addressing a group of children who may sneer or you know, throw spitballs, <laughs> very scary. <laughs> but it's, it's good to be a little bit scared. And it's, it's great fun, the particular challenge of writing for children, you know, that there are, there are still things publishers won't let you do. You know, they, they, they're really nervous of any sort of bad words, for instance. Um, and, you know, they don't let you write at a too great length or anything. So there's all sorts of conventions and it's fun to see sort of how many of them you can break and get Unless away with Unless maybe it will be banned. Then that's, <laughs> that will bring you even more acclaim. It's funny, growing up in Ireland, I just assumed if you're a literary writer at all, you're going to get banned. But then Ireland <laughs> liberalised just about the time my publishing career was started. So really, I've never been banned. You know, I feel most disappointed. Oh, I look forward to reading that. And we didn't even get to talk about Astray, your wonderful collection of short stories. But I so, this has been such a pleasure. It's been great fun. To talk with you. And thank you for being our guest here. I'm Mary Kay Zaravla. Thank you for joining us on Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. <laughs>